Well, thank you so much. It's, uh, it's, it's really wonderful to be here. I, I think I was here once, uh, some, uh, some years back, and uh, it's just got a wonderful feel about this congregation, and I, I just really, uh, really appreciate the invitation. Um, I, I was told to use this one, so there we go. Um, I've, uh, I've been asked to uh, lead in with a, a, a brief meditation. So let's just have us relax for a moment and step away from the thoughts that were with us as we arranged to arrive here today. Relax our bodies, relax our minds, perhaps to close our eyes if you wish, but let go of, of any troubling thoughts you might have and claim your divine attributes. We're here to meet life from a place of power. In meditation, we expand our consciousness, we open our mind to the realization of a divine truth. We are one with spirit. In meditation, I remind myself that I have more than enough courage to thrive. No matter what the state of the world, no matter what the state of my health. I call upon the strength and power of spirit and know that I already have everything I could ever need as a child of God. The Fillmore Invocation tells us that we remain at all times in the presence of pure being and immersed in the Holy Spirit of life, love, and wisdom. Let us acknowledge the presence and power of Blessed Spirit in the divine wisdom now erase my mortal limitations and from thy pure substance of love, bring into manifestation my world according to thy perfect law. Amen. Thank you. So, I, I, I have to say, I was, I was quite blown away by the, uh, by the inter introduction this morning, and uh, I, I uh, can't get home to, I can't wait to get home to uh, tell my daughter the dog story, because she's a dog lover for sure. Uh, and let's start out by saying I bring you greetings uh, from, uh, from Unity of Bellingham. Um, uh, we, uh, we were a congregation about the size of the number of people that are here and, uh, and had the uh, good fortune to, uh, uh, to engage a new minister a couple years ago and, uh, and are now very often a full house and, uh, and as you do, putting, putting stuff online. So, uh, so it's, it's, it's wonderful to see, uh, to see unity healthy and growing and, and uh, the, the spirit that we find in, in, in all the congregations, uh, particularly, you know, they're very fond of the Northwest region, I must say. So, so my title for this morning, uh, Not Perfect But Wonderful, Evolving Our Lives in Unity, it was really uh, inspired by an encounter I had with uh, a senior member of our Bellingham congregation. And a woman that I would have, I imagine she's uh, well into her 90s. And uh, 
I, I greeted her one Sunday morning and inquired how she was. And, uh, and with a smile and a twinkle in her eyes, you know, she quickly responded, said, I'm not perfect, but I'm wonderful. <laughs> and, and I thought the positive energy that she radiated just impressed me so much because I see it in a lot of people uh, who've attended and studied unity over the years. So I, I became curious, actually, to look at the, the spectrum of, of inspiration that's, that's influenced my own evolution in unity over the years. And in doing so, you know, to learn more about where others found inspiration, uh, especially as they aged. And uh, when I was first introduced to unity, I, I was completely taken with the teachings, I have to say. Uh, but the teachings that really impressed me at the time were mostly about metaphysics and 12 powers and uh, and they, they remain fundamental teachings for me. And uh, they're the tools we use to build our life. I, I believe they are truly the keys to the kingdom. Uh, but they're not the last word. And, uh, and what I've found is that the, the part of the unique nature of unity is that there's no dogma. And, and being devoted to unity doesn't preclude us accessing the inspired teachings of a really broad range of spiritual wisdom. Yeah. So one unity minister that I was very close to over several years and in the last decade of her life, uh, you know, spent most of her time uh, practicing Buddhist traditions. Uh, and that's not unusual. Uh, there's room for that sort of eclectic studies being woven into our lives in unity. In fact, the history of unity actually suggests that it's always been so, because there was, uh, uh, in the part of the Fillmore's, there, they were strongly influenced by, by many buried areas of religious thought. Now, the, the psychologist, Carl Jung, uh, he, he wrote something that I see as a valid comment uh, about traditional religions. Uh, he said, one of the main functions of organized religions is to protect people against the direct experience of God. <laughs> and, uh, you, know, <laughs> you know, I think that the absence of that kind of attitude is, is really one of the several distinctions between new thought groups, such as Unity, and, and the more traditional uh, Christian churches. Uh, I, I believe, for example, that it was the very reason that, you know, when William James wrote his famous text, uh, The Varieties of Religious Experience, that, uh, that he referred to the emerging New Thought movement as uh, the religion of healthy-mindedness. Yeah. Uh, while, while studying at, uh, at, at Unity Village, some teachers would describe uh, unity as uh, Christian-based but spiritually unlimited, and, and that, that resonated for me. In, in my own spiritual work, uh, early on, uh, and actually to this day, I've, I found uh, inspiration in the work and teachings of Joseph Campbell. You know? and, uh, and what I learned from Campbell is that the purpose of life is, it, it's not about finding uh, some external meaning. It's, it's, it's more about experiencing life itself really to the fullest and, and even in its messiest moments. Uh, Campbell's writing were the, were the first time that, uh, that I'd ever encountered the concept of the hero's journey. And uh, it's, it's a term that, that quite often is misunderstood because you know, my understanding of Campbell is that in our hero's journey, we're not necessarily just having a fun adventure, you know. But, uh, you know, uh, I mean, rather, it's it's the hero within each of us uh, uh, that, uh, that having their experience in life, and 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 it often means getting kicked about, you know, sometimes humiliated, sometimes disgraced, and at some point, the dragon slays some part of us. Um, I expect you all know from personal experience what, what I'm talking about. I mean, much to your surprise, you couldn't make a marriage work. Uh, much to your surprise, your kids did not follow the path that you intended for them. Uh, much to your surprise, 
the world did not always want the gifts you had to offer. You know. uh, but Campbell tells us that if you're wise, you will let yourself be shattered. And in doing so, you'll, you'll find a new connection to your own existence. We can, we can learn to, to cease limiting ourselves to our predetermined ego needs. Uh, by, their, by their very nature, uh, they tend to be selfish, but it takes us some life experience to get there. Um, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. famously said, uh, I know somehow that only when it's dark enough can you see the stars. Uh, a book that's recently uh, expanded my understanding is, is one called Breathing Underwater, Spirituality in the Twelve Steps. It's, it's written by uh, Father Richard Rohr, a, a Franciscan priest. Expressed in, in terms that, that we're familiar with in unity, uh, Rohr teaches that our affirmative prayer is, is always about getting the who right. You know, who is doing the praying? Uh, is it your ego or the Christ consciousness within you? Uh, it's, our, it's our willingness to find spirit in our own struggle. And, and to let it change us, that expresses our, our deepest and uh, our deepest trust in, in the universe, and, and also leads us to the deepest truth. You know, Carl Jung says, uh, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. Uh, so, so after many years of spiritual work, I've concluded that, that some problems can only be worked out spiritually rather than by hard work and academic thinking. Uh, my point is that we learn that basic truth in unity, but particularly when it comes to embracing and practicing the principles, we can find guidance from many teachers and many traditions. Uh, that, that guidance can provide underpinning for, for further understanding how to, how to navigate, among other things, the inevitable transitions in life. And, uh, you know, I, I guess I, at this point of my life journey, I'm more than ever appreciative of that because I start losing many friends and, and family. Uh, the... The unity teachings have a, have a fundamental understanding of, of love and what we can treasure in life and that so much can, can be enhanced by a broad appreciation of a variety of traditions and teachers. Uh, well, my introdu introduction to unity, it, it, uh, it initiated a profound uh, and positive change in my life. But what I've noticed of myself and others is that such change itself uh, often precedes an unexplained remission. An, an unexplained remission. And, and sometimes I, I uh, experience that. In, in other words, it's not that difficult for us to forget who and what we are and, and the very real and powerful connection that we have to the divine. And, and, and basically forget to use it, you know. Uh, you know, this, this I find it helpful to go back on a fairly regular basis and, um, and, and contemplate it, contemplate the whole issue of the divinity within, because I think that is really the fundamental heart of unity. And, and my go-to source in doing that, in renewing my commitment to, to nurturing my power within, is Eric Butterworth. You know, uh, you know, Oprah's fond of saying that Butterworth's uh, Discover the Power Within was the book that changed her life. And it certainly plays a recur recurring role in, in sustaining my spiritual journey. Now, I haven't specifically mentioned the issue of aging, but I, I must admit it's one that's been on my mind. I, I turned 75 last month, so it's, uh, you know, you, you have to... Well, well, what I've noticed, quite frankly, is that in making personal decisions, uh, for example, about where I'm going to live and how I'm going to live, 
that the issue of what, uh, what time I have remaining on this plane of existence, it's always in the back of my mind. Uh, so I've worked the last while on asking myself, and, and I would offer this suggestion to you, to, to contemplate the question of what profound personal change could I visualize that would have a healing effect on my life at this time? In other words, to revisit the experience that I had in first encountering unity. And the interesting uh, aspect that I've come up with is that maybe after all these years, it, it's simply to, to once and for all uh, get my, keep myself on a path of loving myself. Uh, because to, to love oneself wholeheartedly and unconditionally, just the way you are, is one of the big challenges in life, in my experience. Yeah. And to remember that, that, um, that age does not prevent us from asking ourselves the question, what wows us, you know? What, what fills us with wonder and awe? Because we need to make a space for that in our lives. And, and as or more importantly, we have to find a way to share that with others. Uh, you know, maybe it is something so simple as great conversations, the heart of which is being willing to be vulnerable with one another. Uh, the defini definition of adventure is that something's about to happen, right? Consider the word advent. Right? What do you always look forward to with anticipation? I, I once heard uh, a fellow named Wayne Mueller speak at a Unity convention. I don't know how many of you have encountered Wayne Mueller. He's an interesting man uh, because uh, after, uh, after leaving a career early, not only did he become a writer, but importantly, he founded a major nonprofit called Bread for the Journey, and he does a lot of very positive work. But, I was impressed enough with him at the time that I, I, I uh, was looking through my old materials the other day and, and I found a note that I've written of something Mueller said. And, and it's, it goes like this. We will often try to do what the heart does, but we do it at the speed of the mind. The fact that we cannot do it is not just because we're old, right? Now, I, I took him to mean that there's nothing inherently wrong with slowing down, you know, somewhat, as, we, uh, uh, as we're prone to do as, as we age. But, but allowing oneself to access the time to breathe, relax, and, and live each day one day at a time. And in that, it strikes me that there's, there's always a case to be made for hope. You know, hope is a human construct, right? It's a choice. And the nature of hope is, is to look forward in a positive direction. But if we place our hope on some specific goal, it, it often leads to more disappointment by becoming an expectation. So it takes effort to me remain hopeful that things will work out to the highest and best way for all, with no specific idea of what that might be. Um, but this requires trust. And, and it's trust that you need to have, well, at the same time understanding that everything is impermanent. Yeah. But impermanence is actually our saving grace, because something is always leaving and making way for the new to come forth. And I believe with all my heart that if we can learn to embrace whatever's coming forth in our lives, we will have made the highest and best use of our unity teachings. Yeah. Uh, as, as we close this message today, I, I, I would like to share with you a poem by Hafiz. Uh, I sometimes forget that I was created for joy. My mind is too busy, my heart is too heavy for me to remember 
that I have been called to dance, the sacred dance of life. I was created to smile, to love, to be lifted up, and to lift others up. O sacred one, untangle my feet from all that ensnares. Free my soul that we might dance and that our dancing might be contagious. And, uh, thank you very much for your, your attention today. I, I, I understand that uh, the tradition here, and uh, uh, Tim tells me that uh, you have a brief sharing and time for questions or comments, and uh, I'd be happy to open the floor to that experience. Thank you. And, uh, Your message was beautiful. <laughs> Thank you very much. But, uh, yeah. I, I, t I t totally enjoyed that, uh, what you had to share, and it, it brought up ma many, many, many pictures and imaginings and memories of uh, the uh, in incredible uh, fabric, the weaving that created unity, the background and the people and the variety of experience. Going back to Emma Curtis Hopkins, you know, who uh, got canned from uh, Christian Science because she thought outside the box. Right. And so she was the teacher, one of the main influences of of uh, Charles and Myrtle. And it just seemed unity just seems to keep growing. It doesn't stop anywhere. And you yeah. represented that for us in your in your sharing. And um, I just really appreciated the the depth of your personal experience. And the fact that you came here all the way here to, to share it with us. So thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. And it, um, <laughs> uh, thanks for bringing me back home. I can't stop crying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it, it. Yes. Hi. Oh, sorry. But one here, one here. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Rizzi. You're closer. Oh. Me. <laughs> I found unity in 1973, and it started in 1968. And I went to uh, for I was raised in Fork, and I was I don't know I loved the church we went to there. But when I moved to Port Angeles, uh, my mother-in-law came up and said, Ruth, will you come down? The minister wants you to come down and try out for a singer. And I said, what? Unity? I said, I've never heard of unity before. And she said, well, come on down. So I went down, I sang a song for him, and he said, you're hired. And you know, I have loved unity ever since. It's been my life, and I just, I've been, been, of course, I've always been a loving, positive person all my life anyway, but still, it was, it was just me. I mean, I just, I just changed everything, and i just so happy all the time, and loving, and everything. So, thank God for unity. Thank you so much. <laughs> I love everybody. <laughs> I just love the part about the slowing down and and um, recognizing how it's really um, a positive, graceful thing to do. As most of you know, I'm not a slow person. I'm usually bouncing off the walls, but I have found more and more um, joy and and happiness in recognizing just really taking it slower, being real aware of taking it slower, and each task becomes you know, more special because it's just like, I'm not hurrying through, it, through this, I don't need to, lucky that I can slow down. So I really appreciate that part of the message and um, been, been really feeling that that's uh, kind of a new um, practice for me. And if I might add to that, 
uh, same, same thing, Star, what Connie was saying about slowing down. I feel in many ways, this is like the richest time of my life because I was so driven by one thing after another most of my life. And all of a sudden it's like, you know, I think I'm going to stop this nonsense and just slow down. And life is so much richer and so much more to be appreciated. I just enjoyed the affirmation of we are made for joy. <laughs> we forget that. And to be in joy and uh, express happiness is a really radical thing to do in this world because we are supposed to um, just be in the mode of suffering because somebody else is suffering, you know, like Woody Allen said, you know, I can't feel good if somebody else is not feeling good. Uh, it's, that's not what we were meant to be. We are meant to pick others up because of our joy. And when we spread that joy, that's when we heal the world. And the, that's the end of the um, hero's journey. The purpose of the hero's journey is to bring it back, bring the joy, bring the, the hope, the love, the peace back home. I have a little humor story to tell about Eva that she doesn't even know about. <laughs> Many of us um, know that Rob and I, we kind of keep up with the news a little bit. Sometimes we get sucked in too much but we just kind of want to know what's going on, keep our, our tabs on it. And sometimes we'll be in our house watching something outrageous, like it's so easy to do these days. And Rob will lean over and say, what do you think, Star what do you think Eva would do if she was here? <laughs> what do you think Eva would say? How would she apply her joy to this? <laughs> So Eva lives in our hearts and our thoughts as our joy master much more than she knows. 